everything that, 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 that pertains to the family. And so I want to talk to you about pro- developing prophetic families. Developing prophetic families. I want to read Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18. And, you know, I want to hear God's voice clearer than ever Amen. in my life. I want my children, my children's children to be confident in that they hear God's voice. And especially as we walk into the end of the age, I, I would dare to say that only those who know how to recognize God's voice will be able to live in peace and hope regardless of what's happening around them. And I don't know about you, but I can't afford to wait till next presbytery to hear God's voice. I can't afford for me to wait till somebody else gives me a word as, as great as that is. I long, my heart longs to, to build a house of prophets that they don't not only hear the voice of the Lord for them, but they hear the voice of the Lord on behalf of others. And I dream of, of families, your family, your family in tune with what heaven is saying over the earth. What are you saying today, now, God? That's the question that I want to answer every single day. What are you saying, Lord? So that I can live in harmony with God and in harmony with other people. So I can please my Father no matter the season that I'm in. And so that I don't, I don't become someone who is tossed by circumstances or people's opinions. But I'm led by the Spirit. So Proverbs chapter 29 verse 18 says, Where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraints. Where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraints. In other words, according to the original, where there is no divine communication in a vision or a dream or a prophecy, the people run wild, out of control. Case in point, this is interesting, the sons of Eli, the prophet in 1 Samuel, they were called to be a house of prophets, but they ran wild. They ran out of control. The story tells us that their sin was great before the Lord. Now, why does this happen to the prophet's house? Can I tell you my biggest fear? My biggest fear is that I am successful in ministry, successful in my relationship with God, and my kids are not. I want to go from generation to generation. And so what happened to the, to the prophet's family, right? Why did they run wild? Why did they run out of control Because the Bible says that the word of the Lord, you can read it there in 1 Samuel 3. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. And there was no widespread revelation. In other words, in those days, there was no clear communication between heaven and earth. And much like today, people lived in confusion Guessing, speculating, wondering, divided between ideologies, divided between thoughts. Because the opposite of living and hearing God's voice is living in confusion. Now, let's talk a little bit about this in the context of your family and my family. A family living in confusion lives in constant conflicts one with another. Think about the method that God chose to destroy the enemies of Israel. He would confuse them. And in their confusion, what happened next? They would kill each other. And how many families and churches even live in this way? In their confusion, in their lack of vision, in their lack of of clarity on God's voice, they destroy one another. They engage in constant fights, constant arguments, gossip that leads nowhere but to the breakdown of their relationship. Are are you with me? Also, a family in confusion easily violates the natural and divine order. Let Let me explain it to you this way. 
And the, um, uh, God talks about fathers-in-law who sleep with their daughters-in-law. About people who sleep both with men and women. About sons who sleep with their mothers. And he describes all of these behaviors in the family as perversions. And the word perversion that is used in these passages is also the word confusion. In other words, a family in confusion opens the door to all kinds of perversions. For example, incense. Incest, infidelity, pornography, all kinds of sexual sins like homosexuality, fornication that leads to children born out of wedlock. Our families need the voice of the Lord. My children need the voice of the Lord. And guess what? Our marriages need the voice of the Lord. We need revelation. A marriage living in confusion becomes two individuals going their own way. In other words, we live together, we sleep together, we have children together, but at the end, you go there and I go there. And by the way, it is a lot easier for empty nesters to fall into this trap. And all of a sudden, they discovered that the glue that held the family together was the children and not God. Amen. In fact, in America, empty nesters are the highest number rate of divorce. It's not a marriage covenant. It's just a business agreement. Each one has their own money, their own activities, their own dreams and aspirations. Why? Because there's not a prophetic vision that clearly unites them. They don't, they don't know where they're heading as a unit. Let me ask you this question. When was the last time that you sit down with your spouse or your husband and wife and ask yourself, where, where do we see ourselves in five years? Where do we see ourselves in 10 years? That's a good question, right? Man, I, I see myself older, right? I'm not even going to tell you what, I, what my perception of older is. I don't want to offend anyone. <laughs> but I do see myself older, a lot more gray hair. Um, with my kids married off. And I get to enjoy my wife. Just she and I, we sent our kids postcards. <laughs> See ya. <laughs> but let me, it's important to dream that way, right? And, and let, me, let me just summarize it this way. Divine communication in a vision or a dream or a prophecy allows families and churches to walk in hope, to walk in peace, to walk in unity, now, if I were to ask anyone here, would you like to hear the voice of the Lord more clearly? I can assure you that everybody would say, yes, yes of course. You know, but I have been challenged in, in the last three years especially. I've been challenged not to just pray for clarity in hearing God's voice, but to create an environment in my heart, to create an environment in my home where I can hear the voice of the Lord clearly every day. How do we develop prophetic marriages? How do we develop prophetic children? How do we develop prophetic families? How do we develop the prophetic church? Let me, let me just explain, and, and I know you've heard me say this before. I'm very passionate about it. But if I'm praying, God, speak to me through dreams, and I spend my days or my nights watching horror films, I'm not creating an environment where God can speak through to me through a dream. Or if I, I'm praying and I said, Lord, I want to have a heavenly vision for the future of my family. But I spend my days watching the news. Getting mad at the TV. I'm not creating an environment in my heart where I can see what God sees. I'm creating an environment where I can see what other people see for the future. Or if I'm just talking and talking and talking all day long about how terrible things are in the world or in the nation. I'm not creating an environment where I can see how he sees our complexities. 
how he sees how the world is going. I am, I am for once excited for the acceleration for the end times. Because that means that I get to meet my Lord. We must create an environment in our hearts and in, in our minds and in our homes where we can hear the voice of the Lord. Now, let me, let me suggest to you um, how you do that. How do you create that environment? Um, and the first thing that I want to say is that we must create an environment of blessing. Power of blessing. Great book. Out in the bookstore. After service. Give it to everyone you know. Buy two, three copies. Give it to everybody. We must create an environment of blessing. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29, I'm going to read to you what Paul said. He said, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. But what is good for the necessary edification that it may impart grace to the hearers. Hear what Paul is saying. If it doesn't impart grace to the hearers, don't say it. Man, that is the great line for gossip. If it doesn't impart grace to me, don't say it. Um, let me tell, you, tell a little bit on myself. Um, you know, my kids are young. You all know them. Uh, eight, six, four, and four months. And when my kids would be misbehave, I would come in and fight fire with fire. Until I realized, if I spend all of my mental equity fighting fire for fire, giving them a piece of my mind, setting them up straight, I'm less likely to hear God in the situation. You know, there's different kinds of fires. You know that, right? Electrical fire, uh, grease fire, campfire. And you can't put them all out the same way. In fact, if you throw water to an electrical fire or to a grease fire, you're going to make things worse, right? So as a dad, before doing anything, I must pray. Before correcting my children, I must pray. What kind of fire, Lord, am I encountering right now? And, and, and prayer is good for me because, first of all, it allows me to settle my emotions, and number two, it also allows me to, to know and to hear what Jesus would do in the situation. Hey, Jesus, are we turning some tables today? And sometimes we do, me and Jesus. We got to turn some tables. But it's important for me as a, as a leader, as the leader of my family, that we hear the Lord before acting in any way. Why? Because my words have power. Can you say it with me? My words have power. And as a parent and as a leader, especially, my words have power. And I can't bless my kids one minute and curse them the next. It's counterproductive. Besides the fact that once the word leaves my mouth, I can't take it back. And I may be seriously wounding my children or my wife. Listen to what James said. I love this. James chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. It says, even so the tongue is a little member and it boasts great things. See how great a four is a little fire candles and the tongue is a fire. Let me ask you a question. How many fires have you kindled this week with your words? Or, what we, or, or with what you type on Facebook. I like to say it this way. In any relationship, saying the right thing the wrong way will always be the wrong thing. In any relationship, saying the right thing the wrong way will always be the wrong thing. Sarcasm, negativity, foul language, hurtful words... They make the, the, the right thing become the wrong thing because we're called to inherit blessing. James said in, in James 3, right there, but in verse 11 and 12, does a spring send forth fresh water 
and bitter from the same opening. And then he answers the question, no spring yields both salt water and fresh. Can, can I really es- expect God to, to speak blessing through this opening when all I do is complain about my children or point out at their flaws? I, I, I love this quote by Pastor Kerry. He says that I have the wife that I bless or the wife that I curse. It's true. You know, I grew up as a pastor's kid, and I can tell you this, as somebody who who got in many ways a front seat to counseling sessions and things concerning families, hypocrisy has turned away more children from church than you can imagine. Where they see their parents blessing the Lord, lifting their hands, amen, hallelujah, brother, and yet cursing the family during the week. And I hope that you can hear my heart when I say this, especially, you know, parents with young kids. Sometimes we do have to turn tables. I'm not saying that you don't correct your children. In fact, if you're not correcting your children, you're violating Scripture, right? I wasn't going to do this, but I'm, I, I put this on my notes, and I'm going to read it to you. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 25, 24. He who spares the, his rod hates his son, but he who loves his, him disciplines him promptly. Do not withhold correction from a child, for if you punish him with a rod, he will not die. This is my favorite one. Proverbs 29, verse 15. The rod and rebuke gives wisdom, but a child left to himself brings shame to his mother. So the Bible is clear. Sometimes we, as parents, we do have to turn some tables. Me and Jesus. We and Jesus. But before we do that, we must pray. We must pray because Jesus will always lead us to correct our children in the spirit of love and blessing and not in anger and frustration. And it's easy. I know I'm a parent. I'm in the grind all day, every day. But see, if your kids are grown, because now let's look at it from a different perspective. If your kids are grown and out of the house, maybe they have children of their own, a marriage of their own. You still get to pray for them. You still get to bless them. And I know because I have in-laws and I know because I have parents, it is tricky. And listen to me, if you're a grandparent, I'm so sympathetic towards you. Because it is tricky to define your new role as a grandparent. It is tricky, and I'm very sympathetic towards that. I don't know it by experience, but I know it through my mom and dad and through Keith and Jackie Lynn. But how cool it has been for us, even just as a family, to be able to come to our parents and say, you know what, I'm facing this, and I don't know what to do, and for them to say, you know what, son, you know what, daughter, I hear the Lord say this. How cool would that be for you? To be able to have that ability. How cool would it be if God could use you guys as as spouses to speak prophetically over your husband or over your wife? I know some of the most profound prophetic words that I've received in 2021 and 2022 has been through my wife. And she knows me. But she prophesies the word of the Lord. But hear me. These kind of environment will, will flow flee, freely. These kinds of things will flow freely, freely out of an environment of blessing and not cursing. If you're living in confusion, if you, there's confusing times, you need to hear the voice of the Lord. Another thing that helps make room for the voice of the God is to create an environment of forgiveness. Oh, this is a big one. This is a really big one. You know, a prophetic family doesn't get stuck in the past because they always look forward. A prophetic family doesn't get stuck in the past because they always look forward. Here, here's here's a cool story. Think about Lot's wife. I mean, God gave him and his family a way out of the mess they were in. Out of the chaos, out out of the destruction they lived in. And all they needed to do was what? Look forward. And what did she do? What did Lot's wife do? 
she looked back and she became a statue of salt. Now, believe it or not, God has given your family and my family a way out of the mess that we are in. Out of unforgiveness, out of bitterness, out of resentment, out of hateful, a hurtful past that we may be stuck on. And all we have to do is what? Look forward. How many, how many statues of salt would be standing here this morning if the same thing happened today than it happened to Lot's wife? Ow. No, it would be like more like this. How many husbands and wives throw up? Throw back up the past when they get mad at their spouses. By the way, a lasting marriage is made out of two good forgivers. Or how many grown children, maybe you have experienced this. How many grown children throw the past at their parents' face to explain their crazy present? How many broken families exist today because one, two, or three people we're unwilling to move forward rather than backwards. Offenses are unavoidable in any type of relationship, especially in families. Why? I mean, wouldn't you agree? Why? Because we don't think exactly the same. We have different personalities, different likes and dislikes, and probably, this is a big one, probably different expectations from one another. I'm telling you a funny story. This is silly to me now, but it was a big deal. One year, um, growing up, you know, we, uh, we wanted to give a, I, I held this big grudge against my dad. Because one year, I was almost 10, and I remember my mom, my sister, and I, we got together and we picked out a pair of sandals out of a catalog for him. It was his birthday. And so we, we, we picked the perfect gift. It was the official sandals of his favorite soccer team. And, and for some reason, I felt like that gift meant a lot more to us than he did to him. And I remember when we gave him the gift, uh, he looked at them. Uh, he didn't smile. He, he pointed out a couple of negative things about the sandals. And he said, but thanks. So unimpressed. <laughs> And you know what? I, growing up, I, I just kept that in the back of my mind. So every birthday, every Father's Day, I would say something like, remember the sandals? Gift card. <laughs> remember the sandals? Gift card. That's all he gets. And so when Danielle, when Danielle and I got married, I mean, I, I'm telling you, 10 years old, and Danielle and I got married, um, and my dad's birthday would roll around, she would ask me, you know, hey, what, what are we going to get for your dad this year? Gift card. Because I don't know if I told you before about the sandals. See, our differences in how we received gifts put my dad and I at odds with each other for decades. See, now I changed my perspective because I get to give him a gift card. I don't have to think about it. And I always get him what he wants or what he needs. Win-win. Right? Let me, let me just tell you, the key to not be so easily offended towards your family is to see your differences with your family as something positive and not negative. They are different. Of course they are. They have different strengths, different giftings different perspectives, different talents. And you know what? Those things make you stronger. Think about it. God wants to bless you through how different your family is from you. You know, my wife and I, we're, we're very different from each other. Oftentimes I see blue, she's this indigo. Who says indigo? You know, and, and, and we have different different positions and we're very strong in our positions um, but God has used our differences to make us better now when we talk about forgiveness 
I, I understand. When we talk about forgiveness, I, I know some people will say, but, but you don't know my story. You don't know what they did to me. You don't know all the pain that they cost me. You don't know how complicated it would be for us to restore the relationship. It's far too broken. It's far too, too gone. And, and you're right. I don't know your story. Only you do. But here's what I know as a believer, as a Christian. If you are a Christian, forgiveness is not an option. It's a command. Amen. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 14 and 15, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And this is very strong message. But, but let, me, let me just tell you that there's a blessing in disguise because here's why forgiveness is a command. Because forgiveness sets the offended free. Free from their own sin because the Father then forgives you, but also free from bitterness. Let me say it this way. The offended is the number one beneficiary of forgiveness. And if we want to develop prophetic families, prophetic marriages, we, we can't get stuck in the past. We must hear the heart of the Lord. I love what Pastor Kerry says, and I know I keep quoting him. I have tons of things I can tell you that he's taught me over the years. When we live offended, we hit a pause button in our lives. You can't move forward. You can't move towards your prophetic destiny unless you forgive. Unless you forgive. So we must create an environment of blessing, an environment of forgiveness, and last thing for now that helps make room. I don't know. Do you want to make room for the voice of the Lord in your life? I want to make room. Um, and, and I understand that to make room, I must let go of some things. There's only so much space. Okay, so this is what helps make room for the voice of the Lord. And this is the last one. An environment of intimacy with God. An environment of intimacy with God. If you hear anything I'm, I'm about, I've said today, and you can fall asleep after this. Unless we live in daily expectation of God's voice, we will live reacting to our circumstances. Unless we live in daily expectation of God's voice, we will live reacting to our circumstances. And especially if you're going through a rough time, through a rough season, as a person, as a family, maybe in your company, maybe with your co-workers, make room for the voice of God by positioning yourself in a place where you can hear God's voice. Position yourself in a place where you can hear God's voice. You know, I used to, I used to pray all the time because I used to struggle with hearing God's voice. I, I seriously struggle with hearing God's voice, and I would pray and and I would say, "Lord, open my ears," and "Lord, I, I make room for Your voice," and and I would just pray. And, and you know, I never felt confident that I could hear God's voice. I, I just never did. I remember specifically one time. We were in night of ministry, and, and I was sitting right there where those fabrics are. And Pastor Kiri gave me a word, and, and he said, you know, I heard the Lord say that he's going to use you prophetically. And, and then at the end, he walked, out, he walked off, and he said, and I'm expecting great things. And, and, I, and, I, and whenever he said that, I thought, man, like, but I want to. But I can't. I want to. But I can't. I remember a couple of times he gave me an opportunity to, he put me on the spot and I just would go blank. And it's so frustrating. Anybody has ever felt that way? It's so frustrating. And so at the end of 2020, I decided to uh, position myself. And I started, um, and by the way, if you ever see me pull my phone out, I'm not, I'm not playing Candy Crush, okay? Um, I'm usually writing a word from the Lord. 
I have a, on my notes, on my, see, there you go. First thing pulls up, whispers of the Holy Spirit, 2023. I've done that for over, a little bit over three years now. And you can see, this is all the words that God has given me in 2023. Ooh, going fast, going fast, going fast, going fast, going fast. Okay, so I decided, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to position myself to hear the voice of the Lord. And, and I've done that now. And, um, and if you have ever given me a word, your word is probably on this phone. And it's been such a blessing to me. You know what? To know what God is saying from point A to point B, it's been such a blessing. Especially for a planner like me. It's been such a blessing, especially when the storms have started raging against our family in these last three years. And it's been such a blessing. You know, our goal should be to position ourselves to hear the voice of the Lord. If I can say it this way, we must stay in the sheepfold. In the sheepfold. Let, let me just explain to you. Jesus gave this illustration, and I love it. It's become one of my favorite passages of Scripture. In John chapter 10, verse 2 through, uh, two to, through 4, he said this. He said, but he who enters, I want you to listen to the Scriptures with such attention. This is important. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Okay? To him, the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them. And the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. I I want you to notice, where are the sheep? They remain in the sheepfold. In the presence of of the shepherd and in that place is where they hear the voice of the shepherd in that place is where he calls them by name in that place is where he gathers them in that place is where he leads them oh I must position myself to be in the sheepfold You know, the first time that I heard God call me by name was in the shower. You've heard my stories of the shower. And I heard the Lord say, Frankie, a leader led by the Spirit called to bring heaven to earth. And the rest of it sounded nice. All I heard was Frankie. Oh. Intimacy with God is the key to hearing God's voice. I have to show up to the shower. I have to show up when he calls my name. I have to make room for his voice. We need his voice. As the world gets crazier and crazier, we must get solid in the voice of the Lord. And by the way, I wasn't planning on saying this, but I'm just telling you, His voice sounds like His Word. His voice will never, ever, 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 ever replace His written Word. It was just reflected. Even if it sounds nice, if it doesn't reflect the Word, probably not good so become a studier 